modern day-to-day -day lives are made of countless interactions with the objects we encounter. From the tiniest particles to the biggest structures. Join us as we explore the inside workings of the world around us. This is Inside Things. We Game Controls Gaming was revolutionized with the Nintendo Wii. The Wii allows us numerous ways to interact with the world inside the game. Controlling characters and other objects via our body movements. But how does the Wii work? It combines a motion sensing technology and pointing system to allow interaction between the gamer and the game. The Wii also contains a speaker and an audio amplifier bit, which can give audible feedback from within the remote. It also has a memory chip that can store up to 15 kilobytes of information. How does it translate movement? The Wii makes use of a pivotal accelerometer that can sense movements on the X-axis for side-to-side -side movements, Y-axis for up-and-down movements, and the Z-axis for front-to-back movements. The accelerometer gathers the strength of forces from the gamer that's applied on the remote. Then, a data converter translates the force data into signals sent to the Wii console via Bluetooth. The Wii also contains an infrared sensor at the head of the remote. This translates the signals by the sensor bar near the television and are used to determine the location of the remote. So, when the light from the sensor moves to the bottom of the Wii camera, the cursor moves to the top of the screen, and vice versa. The console then creates a visual representation of the movements. Finally, the Wii also has a rumble pack on the bottom of the remote, which vibrates to match the actions within the game. So, from the traditional two-hand controllers and joysticks, here's what you can do now with your Wii. First, controller is very fast and accurate. You can expect things to respond exactly as you moved it. Second, the gaming experience is closer to the real thing, such as with sword fighting or a fishing game. The Wii controls are much better than with a joystick. And finally, the Wii allows you actual physical action, especially with active games. Playing tennis or boxing can work you up like a cardio workout because of the Wii. Springs what is a spring? It is a tightly wound coil or spiral of metal that can stretch when you pull it or apply a force and then goes back to its original shape when you let go of it or remove the force. Therefore, a spring has elasticity. And depending on how a spring is made, it can work the other way too. A spring can compress when you squeeze it, but it will go back to its original shape when you let go of it. A spring isn't always made of metal. In fact, you can make a spring out of paper or even an orange peel. But the springs in machines have to be made of metal for it to work effectively. This is because the strings have to be stiff enough to resist the pulling force and be durable enough to be stretched without breaking. Such springs can be made of stainless steel or tough alloys like bronze. 
Now, how do springs work? Take, for example, a paper clip that you've unwrapped. When you try to pull it with your hands, it's difficult to stretch. But try coiling it around a pencil. With little effort, you can make a spring out of a paper clip wire. And when you pull to get it out of the pencil, you'll find it easier to stretch or compress it. But why do the same piece of metal react differently? Why is the paper clip, as a stretched wire, stubborn, and as a spring, more cooperative? This is because when a material is in its original form, stretching it would mean tugging the atoms out of their position and the metal's crystal structure. By coiling the paper clip around the pencil, you exerted force to bend it, storing some energy into the spring. So the spring is now pre-stressed. As a spring, it's easier to change its shape a bit more. And the more windings it has, the more you're able to change its form. So with just little force, you're able to stretch or squeeze the spring greatly. This is because the spring is able to absorb the energy you've exerted in it. Turbines. What are wind turbines? Wind turbines work on a quite simple principle. First, it gets energy from the wind to turn two to three propeller-like blades around a rotor. This rotor is what's connected to the main shaft, which spins a generator that creates electricity. But how does this generate electricity? Think of how the electric fan operates, but the other way around. Wind turbines use wind to make electricity. The wind is a form of mechanical energy and is a result of uneven heating of the atmosphere by the sun, the irregularities of the Earth's surface, and the rotation of the Earth. Wind flow patterns and speed vary across different locations and are also dependent on bodies of water, vegetation, as well as differences in terrain. We usually use wind flow, or what we may call motion energy, for many purposes, such as sailing, flying a kite, and yes, generating electricity. A wind turbine converts the wind's kinetic energy into mechanical power, which is then used for tasks such as pumping water or grinding grain. Another common use is powering a generator that can convert this mechanical power into electricity. There are two types of common wind turbines. The first are the horizontal axis variety, which usually have either two or three blades. These are operated upwind, which means that the blades are facing into the wind. The other type is the vertical axis design, which is similar to the egg beater style Darius model, named after the French inventor of the same name. These wind turbines can be built on land or offshore in large bodies of water such as oceans and lakes. Usually, utility-scale turbines range from 100 kilowatts to as large as several megawatts. These are cost-effective and are grouped together in a wind farm to offer maximum power to the electrical grid. Meanwhile, single, smaller turbines, which are below 100 kilowatts, are used for homes, particularly to power telecommunication dishes or aid in water pumping.
golf balls. You'll be amazed to see what's inside a golf ball. Technology has improved its cover, such as employing new dimple patterns to help the ball fly farther and straighter. And so have its interiors. Beneath the cover are a mix of different materials and structures to make its play better. So what makes a golf ball? First is its core. There are many, many different elements and ingredients that make up a golf ball's core. There was a time before when liquid cores were commonly used in three-piece golf balls. Some golf balls contain salt water and corn syrup blend. But today, most golf balls have cores made from synthetic rubber, or a mixture of this with other bits of metal, such as tungsten or titanium, or a plastic-like material like acrylic. Next are its inner layers. Before, most golf ball cores were wrapped with synthetic rubber or plastic, but since 2012, most balls contain five pieces. Its cores are wrapped in three more firm layers of synthetic rubber, HPF 1000, a kind of ionomer resin, and thermoplastic. Finally, its weight and size. Regulations dictate that golf balls should weigh 1.62 ounces or 28.35 grams. There's no minimum weight for golf balls. Meanwhile, its diameter shouldn't be smaller than 1.68 inches or 4.27 centimeters. Because of the mixture of content a golf ball may have, some have actually gone as far as slicing the golf balls to examine its contents. Inside, they have discovered a work of art, a mixture of ingredients in different colors. Here, we list down some of the most popular golf balls with interesting contents. Original feathery golf balls from the 1600s to 1800s had tiny goose and duck feathers in it. Rubber Haskell balls circa 1898 to 1970s had contained brown wound rubber. The 1967 Spalding ball has a solid rubber core inside a low-spin Serlin cover. Serlin is an ionomer resin that's used mostly in packaging for its seal-through contamination properties. The Nike RZN White houses a resin polymer in our core. And finally, the Srixen Q-Star boasts a Serlin cover with a molecular covering that increases friction. Hand Grenades What is a hand grenade? Simply put, hand grenades are small bombs that act like firecrackers. Like firecrackers, these are made with a paper body that's filled with gunpowder or any explosive or chemical filler, plus a small fuse. When this fuse is lit, it burns down until it reaches the powder, which explodes. The only difference is that it'd take a person to light up a firecracker such as with a match, while the hand grenade is activated via a mechanical device. How? First, hold the grenade with the hand you'll use to throw it with. Place your thumb over the safety lever. With your other hand, pull out the safety pin. Then, release the safety level and throw the grenade. A spring throws off the safety lever and rotates the striker into the primer. The primer contains material similar to the head of a match. When this is struck, it ignites and sets fire to the fuse. Now, the fuse begins burning at a controlled rate, providing time to delay for up to 5 seconds. And when the flame of the fuse finally reaches the detonator, or the small blasting cap, it causes the grenade to explode. There are different types of hand grenades. First are the offensive grenades. These are filled with explosive charge fillers or flake TNT, contained within sheet metal ends and pressed fiber sides. These are used for demolition effects and to stun enemies while in enclosed places. 
Next are the fragmentation grenades. Its cast iron bodies are designed to break into fragments upon explosion. Such grenades weigh as much as 21 ounces or 595 grams. Meanwhile, chemical grenades are made for various purposes. Produce a toxic or irritating effect, a screening or signal smoke, or to cause fire or explosion. Some of these grenades come with metal straps that prevent it from rolling and contain an igniting fuse that allow for only up to 2 seconds delay time after the lever is released. One popular example of the chemical grenade is the baseball-type tear gas grenade that's often used for riot control. The fourth grenade type are the practice grenades. These contain only a reduced amount of charge fillers for safety use while training. And lastly, the training grenades. These contain zero amount of explosive charge or chemical and are used particularly for throwing practice. Hot Air Balloons How do hot air balloons work? Well, it operates on the basic principle that warmer air rises in cooler air and hot air is lighter than cooler air and contains less mass per unit of volume. Mass is the measure of how much matter an object contains. Now, to demonstrate further, let's take a look at the parts of the hot air balloon. The envelope is simply the balloon made of fabric, which holds the air. It has to be large enough to contain heated air that will lift it off the ground. For instance, an envelope would need up to 65,000 cubic feet or 1,841 cubic meters of air if it were to lift 1,000 pounds or 453,592 grams. The burner is what propels heat inside the envelope. The burner uses propane gas to heat up the air into the envelope. This is also what makes the balloon move off the ground and rise into the air. And the basket is where the passengers and the pilot can stand right. To begin, the pilots must keep firing the burner at regular intervals throughout the flight. This is to ensure that the balloon remains stable. Hot air doesn't escape from the hole at the bottom of the envelope because first, hot air naturally rises. And second, buoyancy, which is the upward force that keeps it moving upwards. For it to rise, the pilot opens up the propane valve, which lets the gas flow into the burner, which then fires up into flames and into the envelope. To move it downwards, the pilot uses a parachute valve. The parachute valve is a circle of fabric that's cut out of the top of the envelope. This is controlled by a long cord which runs down through the middle of the envelope and to the basket. To steer the balloon downwards, the pilot simply has to pull the cord that opens the valve. This allows hot air to escape, decreasing the envelope's inner air temperature, or rather, cooling it. This is what slows down the balloon and brings it down. Meanwhile, the balloon can move horizontally by going with the natural direction of the wind. Wind blows in different directions at different altitude. So the pilot just has to match the wind's direction by ascending or descending the balloon to the specific level so that it can ride with the wind. Hydroponic planting What is hydroponics? The word hydroponic comes from the Latin word that means working with water. Simply put, hydroponic gardening is the art of growing plants without soil. Most people assume that with hydroponics, plants are grown with their roots directly in water and with no other growing medium. But this is just one type of hydroponic gardening. 
It's called the Nutrient Film Technique, or NFT. But there are several variations of the NFT method, plus many, many more techniques of hydroponic gardening. Why does hydroponics work so well? Now the reason why hydroponics works effectively is because it carefully attends to the specific needs of the plants. What it needs, when it needs it, how often, and in what amounts. This way, the plant grows to become its healthiest. And as compared to soil, hydroponics seems to be an easier process. Here, plants are grown in an inert growing medium. In a perfectly balanced pH-adjusted nutrient solution, that's delivered to the plant's roots in a highly soluble form. Because of this, the plants are able to absorb everything it needs with just little effort. Unlike with soil, the roots have to look for the nutrients and extract these. Another downside is that the soil may be lacking in nutrients. Usually, this happens when the soil has been used for successive plantings. Now what is growing medium? Growing medium is the material in which the roots of the plant are growing. It may contain a variety of substances including rock wool, perlite, vermiculite, coconut fiber, gravel, sand, and many more. But this isn't what gives the plants nutrition. All the nutrition comes from the nutrient solution, which is a mixture of water and fertilizer. The nutrient solution is easy to control, depending on what the plants need to receive. The strength and pH of the nutrients can also be adjusted so plants get just the right amount of food. Likewise, the watering and feeding cycles can also be controlled by timer and on a set schedule. There you have it. Another episode down the drain. Still, there are countless more things to explore. Join us next time as we look and know more about the world around us. See you next time on Inside Things.